Hello everyone, my name is Xabu and this, this is happening again! A new DLC for Unity of Command 2. And the one whose release is actually celebrating the 10th anniversary of the series. And what better way to do it with a return to the original German campaign from the first game, in a fancier, bigger, better way with the Stalingrad DLC, which unsurprisingly covers the German summer offensive of 1942 and beyond, with 15 historical scenarios leading you through the actual events of 1942 and 43, and typical of Unity of Command, an alternative nine mission branch that explores the possibility of the Germans focusing on Caucasus and turning the Don Bend and Stalingrad into a secondary part of their front, with a completely ahistoric Munstein landing on the Taman Peninsula, and ultimately crazy pushes as far as Azerbaijan and Armenia. So, at the time I'm recording this, I have gone through about a third of the DLC, both the historic and the alternative tracks, and my impressions are absolutely wonderful so far. This is Unity of Command at its best and its hardest. You will have to fight against crazy odds and against a very, very nasty AI that knows how to launch a deadly attack that forces you to restart the mission, and actually has plenty of resources to launch those attacks. This DLC kind of echoes the Moscow 1941 campaign, in the sense that it requires the player to change the gear to explore some of the tricks and abilities they may have been aware of but haven't used properly, and in some cases change their route look on how a battle should be run in general. This expansion is certainly not geared towards newbies, and if you only have the base campaign Victory in the West under your belt, it's more advisable to go for Barbarossa, for example, which in my opinion is a much more balanced introduction into the German style of warfare in this game, and only then go for Stalingrad. And if you enjoyed Moscow 41 as much as I did, well, just get the DLC, it's everything we're used to, and more. So far, I've found that the developers really, really, really wanted you to use use all of those defensive operations abilities that your HQs have, specifically rearguard and especially counterattack, which can be indispensable for your troops in many of the missions because the Soviets will counterattack and they will have plenty of troops. So make sure your HQs actually have these abilities in addition to set piece attacks and fire superiority, etc. etc. It's also worth pointing out that unlike Barbarossa, Stalingrad doesn't make this very, very clear distinction between normal armies and tank armies. While obviously the HQ abilities are all the same, your attack armies will often have infantry in them. And given the distances you quite often need to cover in this DLC, getting the motor pool ability for that infantry is a really good idea. Also speaking of HQs, the game actually does a new thing by introducing the Hungarians, the Romanians and the Italians as HQs that you can upgrade and buy abilities for, and you should. Look at the scenario charts and plan your ability investments. It'd be very unfortunate to get a Hungarian HQ that can't launch set-piece attacks, for example, by the end of the campaign. So while all of these allied HQs are a secondary priority, they are a priority nonetheless. The HQs aside, there is a trick that we'll keep returning to in this campaign, and it's the trick of blocking the enemy reinforcement slots to prevent the enemy from, well, getting there as reinforcements. The opportunity for this has cropped up occasionally in previous campaigns and missions. Stalingrad is a place where you'll find yourself doing this fairly often, so whenever you start a mission, look at the reinforcements that the enemy is about to receive, and the corresponding locations, and probably plan for ways to block them. And the final point for today, unlike Barbarossa, be stingy with your troops and try to lose as few of them as possible and in general try to avoid combat as hard as possible in many of the missions you'll just need to advance and quite often bypassing your enemy is easier than attacking it especially since unless they're completely destroyed your divisions are not going to be reinforced 
in between the missions. This is not victory in the West anymore. All right, now on to the missions we are gonna look at today. Today is not gonna be a long video with only four missions of the first two conferences of the DLC. From the second Battle of Kharkov to File Blau 2. As usual, at least now, I am playing all of these missions on hard difficulty. I never buy any cards during conferences. And during missions, I only use cards if I know that I'm getting a replacement in the same mission. There might be exceptions to that, like getting a paratrooper division card and using it during the same mission, but it's something I will try to avoid and I will warn you of that in my explanations. Now let's look at the doodles. In a nice little throwback to the original Unity of Command, this DLC starts with a second Battle of Kharkov mission, and unlike its Unity of Command 1 counterparts, it's somewhat easy, even though not without its challenges. Actually, this mission should also remind you of the Barvenko offensive mission from Moscow 41 DLC, except that this time we're losing the German pushback against that offensive. And the main thing that you need to realize about this mission is that this whole salient around Barvenkova is fed through a tiny little hex just west of Kupiansk and north of Izum. And your units are actually next to that hex, and you know already what I'm gonna say next. Use that flying artillery you're provided with, bombard the defenders of the hex, and kick them out. You can actually send your tanks to take Kupiansk on turn one, and there's really no good reason for you not to do it, except that I recommend you to give those tanks either counter attack or rear guard because Kupansk is a flat plane hex and so it's have plenty of mobile reinforcements to counterattack you with and losing tank divisions this early in the campaign trust me it's not a good idea so be careful and hold that forested road junction in just a few turns this huge soviet hold around barvenko will turn into mush and you won't have to do much more than mop it up nevertheless despite the supply problems the salient will keep advancing and will launch a full-blown attack into the area between Krasnograd and Kharkov. So prepare for a defense in that area. You actually can retreat a little to give the Soviets some space and prevent them from ganging up on your units. Even though I suggest not clearing the route towards Kharkov. On the one hand, it's slightly more defensible because of the forest. On the other hand, because Kharkov is going to be threatened from the north and you really don't want to put that city into even more jeopardy. And speaking of the attack from the north, North, it's actually going to be much nastier than what you have in the salient. Primarily because of the supply situation, you're not going to be able to cut these guys off. So be defensive in the north. The Soviets will push towards Kharkov. I haven't seen them trying to attack Belgorod, to be honest. Don't get your tanks into more trouble than they can take. Be defensive about them. Use defensive abilities and try to sap the Soviet push, especially their mobile reserves. If any of their elite cavalry or tanks show up on the horizon, try hard to destroy them, and if it is a bit too difficult to deal with the approaching infantry, try and outflank and encircle it and deal with it a bit later. If you actually manage to handle this onslaught, you are going to be fine, and obviously neither Barvenkovo nor Resume should be of any difficulty for you. You have plenty of strong and well-equipped mobile units in that area, so advance north right from the start, and without the supplies, the defenders are going to get weaker and weaker with every turn. The intricately named Tappenjagd und Störfang is another reminder of a really annoying mission from Unity of Command 1. This time it's the Crimea tutorial mission, notorious for being so difficult to take all of the objectives on time in. And I must say that in this game it's slightly more palatable. Let's talk about the Sevastopol part first because it's gonna be incredibly easy. The combination of very friendly deadlines, the fact that you are getting crapless of specialist steps on 
turn 5, artillery and engineers included. And finally, the fact that by the time you need to take Sevastopol, you will have moved all of your troops from the east and your HQ to focus on the city and you will have plenty of resources to use your set-piece attacks and feint attacks to clear all of those objectives with hardly any losses. The tricky bit is actually in the east at the beginning of the mission. So your immediate objective will be to kill that 47th army unit and what you need to do is what actually happened in real life is push through those marshes and then north to encircle the 47th army unit and corner it and destroy it. It's actually a good idea to use your saturation strike in that area to actually clear your path on turn one. In the subsequent two turns, the Soviets will try to entrench their troops, so try to find the weakest points and break through towards Kerch. Don't forget about your flying artillery, it's specifically for Kerch, you don't need it at Sevastopol. Also, don't forget about your tank, so deck it out give it a recon step, allowing it to actually do recon in force without losing its action. You're probably not gonna end turn 2 standing directly next to Kerch, and you will have to push through those zones of control, so it actually might be a good idea to clear them using recon. The final Blau 1 mission is full of deceptions. On the one hand, you've got plenty of troops, really well equipped, experience and everything. Surely the Soviets will fall very quickly and those objectives are not too far. There are also interesting locations for attack except that the Soviets will bring in crap loads of tanks into this battle, capable of mauling even the best of your divisions, and those avenues of attack might be just traps to slow you down. Also, look at that Rossosh objective and remember that you have to take it by turn 6. Yeah. So let's start with that part of the map because it's slightly easier actually. So it seems a bit counterintuitive in the area east of Belgorod that you need to break through to that river and end the turn by building a pontoon bridge there. So it's a good idea to actually give your 6th army the pontoon bridge ability. Why you ask? Because you will not be able to clear the normal railway bridge and repair it by the beginning of turn 2 because on turn 2 you will get crap loads of reinforcements in that area and your task will be to flood the other bank of the river with those troops. One of the tank divisions, hopefully the weaker one, should advance along the edge of the map towards Rossosh. It's not going to be defended, as you can see, and the Soviets will not rush to retake it, so just come in, take it, and go about your business as usual. Capturing the edge of the map there will also prevent the Soviets from getting reinforcements in that area, and you really don't need them there, so this little maneuver is crazy. Critical. The rest of your troops should advance along the other bank of the river, clear or bypass any tanks they face. The Soviets will probably counterattack there. Your ultimate goal will be to push towards Rakseevka and block that railway line leading from that town. This is the southern and more difficult to reach railway line feeding the salient around Staria Skol. And both the Alexeevka and Ostrogorsk objectives, in my opinion, are the most difficult in this mission. Accept some losses among your tanks and motorized divisions if you must. The deadlines are pretty tight in there and you might not have a choice. All right, now let's look at the north. And I know there is that little gap around Livni that you might build a pontoon bridge on and advance through, except not. This is a trap. There is crap loads of well-equipped, extremely well-entrenched Soviet infantry there, and even the best of your units will stuck in there for much longer than you should. So leave that little salient all together and combine all your troops to push directly from Kursk. On turn one, push as far as you can, dealing as much damage to the freestanding Soviet divisions. By freestanding, I mean those that are not well entrenched. If you can, try to dislodge those Soviets sitting in the forest. You will have to do it during your initial turns in any case and get as many of your mobile troops to the east as possible. By the way, positioning a supply hub just north of that forest is probably optimal for the entire mission. In any case, on their turn, the Soviets will counterattack. As you can see, they've got plenty of tanks and will not hesitate to use them 
by the way, as you can see, most of them are green units. So try to deal as much damage to them while they're still green. And obviously send your rare support attacks to kill them because it's a bonus if they're green. It's critical that you kill all of these mobile reserves that the Soviets have as quickly as possible because on subsequent turns, they will get a lot of mobile reinforcements around Lielets and grinding for all of these Soviet tank waves will be a part of this mission inevitably. So similarly to Second Kharkov, while you need to advance east, you should also be defensive and expect attacks from the north. This is an excellent location to use your counterattack ability because your tanks are very strong and better than anything that the Soviets have, while the AI will be very tempted to kill some of your tank divisions if it sees an opportunity to surround them and will attack them. In the area north of the railway leading to the Don objective, counterattack and rearguard are going to be your biggest friends. As for the objectives themselves, you probably are not going to have too much trouble taking Don, so send one tank division there. Voronezh will probably be slightly more difficult. And what I did was bring up the second army HQ, a bit closer to those objectives, build a pontoon bridge to a hex next to Voronezh, send the tank division into that hex, use flying artillery on Voronezh, take Voronezh, and, well, hold those hexes. The Hungarian division that you'll get a little later is actually ideal for this task of guarding these objectives. Finally, don't forget to send a bunch of your troops to Stariaskol. Its defenders will almost certainly be fully fortified by the time you reach the town, and it's also a good idea to block the northern railway leading to Stariaskol as quickly as possible. In combination with your southern thrust, you can comfortably block the entire salient by turn 3, and take Stariaskol with that too much difficulty especially if you bring some artillery engineers there. And final piece of advice, don't use your flying artillery attacks on anything but your objectives. Obviously, as I've already mentioned, Voronezh is where you pretty much have to use the flying artillery. And based on my experience, you'll have to use the other one either in Ostrogorsk or in Alexeyevka. Please don't use them on any enemy units. It's very tempting, I know, but you can actually deal with them with what you've got on the ground. You know how they say the sequel is always worse than the original? Well, Fileblau 2 is much harder, more annoying than the first one, so I think the rule still stands. This is certainly the toughest challenge we have for us today. And while the most difficult bit is actually around the Secure the Dawn objectives, let's first talk about all of the rest. The briefing tells you that it's a rather poor idea to attack around Voroshilovgrad and and it's true. As you can see, the Soviets have a significant number of troops in the area, well entrenched, well experienced, well equipped. And while you can actually penetrate pretty deep towards Voroshilovgrad and actually beyond, they have more than enough troops to comfortably and very effectively counterattack and wipe out your entire divisions. This place is a huge sink for your troops, so don't break through. The same is true about the little gap in the Soviet defenses northeast of Stalino. If you don't want to lose your divisions, don't go there. So the course of action here is this is your secondary front. With limited objectives, namely blockade the enemy troops around Slavyansk. The Soviets will happily use that bridge to send tanks and cavalry in and stab you in the back. While your second and more important objective is to play attrition warfare. Even though breaking through is out of the question, you still have plenty of forces to push the enemy and damage it as hard as possible. Weaken the Soviets in the area and use the fact that you have three HQs there. Don't just rely on your Panzer Army troops bringing some units from the 17th Army and the Italian Army and use them to provide feint and set-piece attacks 
cracks in wiping out at least some of the Soviet divisions because later on the mission, your main thrust will cut the enemy supply off in this area and you'll be able to actually properly destroy them and take Russia of Grad and everything. It's a good idea to be prepared there by that point. All right, let's look at another part of the front that is slightly less important, i.e. the entire Western salient and obviously you shouldn't attack there. But at the same time, you shouldn't also waste too many troops actually holding the Soviets because they're not going to attack there. And you should definitely protect the stretch of railway between Ostrogorsk and the initial position of the 6th Army. The Soviets will actually try to attack you there right from the start, hoping to block that supply line. And it is imperative that you prevent them from doing that. Try to damage that tank division, even if it involves some losses, and set up infantry with AT steps in that gap, in addition to infantry divisions actually guarding the railway itself. This is critical, and failure here can be mission ending. And finally, now let's look at the main thrust, which I've been baiting you with for this entire explanation. So, the railway between Ostrogorsk and Timirovka, Milirovo, Kaminsk, etc., etc., is the lifeline for success of this mission, and all of your best resources must be directed towards clearing that railway and then guarding it. On turn one, do everything to break through that elite cavalry division. This is really annoying, I know, but you have to do it. Don't hurry with taking the Secure the Don 1 objective. You can take it on turn two. You have some infantry there. Because your tanks, your motorized divisions, must push along the railway line and get as far as possible. Reaching Kantemirovka by the end of turn one is a good sign. And at that point, you should send a couple of divisions to to secure the Don 2, and one tank division to push towards Mirovo and ultimately Morozovsk. As you can see, that tank division will be unlikely to face any kind of resistance in that area. You can comfortably take Morozovsk absolutely empty, use your aerial supply theater asset, and don't worry too much about setting up proper supply lines. And since we're talking about that part of the mission, once you take Morozovsk, push towards Surovikino, it's also going to be empty if you're doing everything on time. Take sort of you can know, get your HQ bonus and leave that area. Just guard Morozovsk. The Soviets are going to bring in lots of reinforcements in that area later, but I've found that they are very passive and will not try to counterattack. They'll just blow up the bridges and sit around sort of you know. Back to the secure the Don objectives, use your best troops to do that. Secure the Don 2 is probably the best location for using your flying artillery ability. This is the only one one of the secure Don Hexes that is a city, so it might be troublesome to your tanks and motorized divisions. And don't forget that the Soviets will not cross the river if you're blocking the bridges. So as those Hungarian divisions come in as reinforcements, you can actually block the bridges at Ostrogorsk using those divisions and free up the Germans for guarding the railway leading from Kintimirovka to Mirirova, etc, etc. Because as they see you advancing along that railway line, the Soviets will try to block it. As you can see, the Soviets have plenty of tanks in that salient, and the AI will not hesitate to use them to do that. So as your tanks and motorized divisions advance into the map, advance towards the secure the Don objectives, use your infantry divisions and specifically their zones of control to protect the railway, specifically up to that section of Mirava where the river begins and it becomes slightly safer. Once all the secure the Don objectives are yours, was pushed towards Rostov. It is at this point that you'll completely block off the railway lines feeding Vrashilovgrad and the entire salient, and you can actually start using your first Panzer army to break through at Vrashilovgrad. Still, be somewhat careful, the AI there is very aggressive, but by this point, it's very possible that you'll be able to send some of those first army tanks and motorized units to help you out at Rostov. Finally, send one tank division that you probably don't need as much to take the for Sal River objective. Once again, if you're on time, you're not gonna see any enemies in there. And if you're successful enough, you can actually end the mission before the Soviets bring any reinforcements into that area. Good luck.
and this is it for today. I'm still playing through this campaign, both his branches at the same time, and the next video coming very, very soon is going to cover the entirety of the third conference in the Stalingrad DLC, both the alternative history and the history history scenarios. So do all the subscribe, be likey things, and we'll meet again. Cheers.